Manny, thank you so much for joining us today and your willingness to be our first person. Thanks so much. Try not to look up. Best to look right at the family in the front and the first few Who rows. Who are these people? <laughs> Manny, you were, you were born in Riga, Latvia in 1936, but your f stay there was a short one before you moved to Budapest, Hungary. War began in Europe when Germany invaded Poland September 1st, 1939, when you were three years old. Let's begin first with you telling us about your family, why your parents were in Budapest leading in the years leading up to the start of World War II and the Holocaust. Well, Bill, as you said in the introduction, <clears throat> my father's uh, goal and dream in life was to be a cantor in the city of Budapest, which was a very significant Jewish community, a city of a million people, 20% Jewish. People sometimes ask me, do I, did I have friends who are not Jewish? I did, but basically it was a Jewish community in which I live because that was 20% of the population. My father had wanted to go to Budapest from the time that he finished his training in Austria, in Vienna. He was born in that part of Hungary called Transylvania, and you might remember there was one person that you know from Transylvania. You recall? He told, he told me he never met him. But in any case, he was born in Austro-Hungary. When he was 18 years old, he had to serve in the Czech army. As a Czech army, retired, not retiree, but whatever, graduate, and therefore a kind of a titular Czech citizen and a Jew, Hungary would not give him working papers. He could not take a job in Hungary. He did take a job in Latvia because that's a place that, that, that had no such restrictions, and it was a very important position in terms of that kind of work. In 36, he received permission to get papers to go to Hungary, and he thought he achieved his life's dream and would be there for the rest of his life. And except for the little fellow with a mustache, he would have been there. Mm -hmm. You, Manny, you told me a significant story that your mother told that went along the lines of something like, okay, you now speak Yugoslavian. But what was the significance of that? Well, as I said a minute ago that my father was in Austro-Hungary, the place was Austro-Hungary, it later became Hungary, uh, then it became Czechoslovakia, today it's in the Ukraine. The village did not move. The, the various ruling groups did as a consequence of change. In my mother's situation, my mother was in 1908, and when she was about 10 years old, the First World War ended, at which point this had been technically Hungary. Northern Yugoslavia was ethnically Hungary. The teacher comes into the classroom and says one day, all right, kids, tomorrow, and these are 10-year-olds, so we're going to change language from Hungarian to Serbo-Croatian. If anybody knows either of those languages, you know there's not anything that is similar between the two, not even the alphabet. Serbo-Croatian is written in Cyrillic, like Russian, and Hungarian is written with Latin characters. The kids said, fine, give us new books, we'll be perfectly happy. They were totally bilingual. But it was not unusual to have this kind of change take place, where people went from one language to another, one country to another, without moving. Yeah, and almost overnight in some Absolutely. cases. Absolutely. Manny, your, um, your father landed a very important position as a cantor in Budapest. Before he took that position, I, as I recall, he'd been offered positions in London and other places where it would have been much safer. Um, why did he choose Budapest? Well, my father's notion of <clears throat> wanting to go to Budapest was kind of uh, circuitously done. That's why he went to Riga. Yes, he went to places like Hook of Holland, Groningen, London, where they had these uh, auditions. And he was selected everywhere he went, but his dream was to be in Budapest. That was his, if you want to use it, that was his major league, and that's where he wanted to be. In fact, I remember you telling me that for your father, he felt as though he had hit, quote, the big time Absolutely. in Budapest. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was big time, and not just by time. his measurement, Budapest was a very significant place, and to be a, one of the chief candidates of Budapest was an achievement that most people were unable to achieve. Manny, while the full force of the war and the Holocaust would not hit your community in Hungary until 1944, 
there were still many difficulties once war was underway in Europe in the fall of 1939. Tell us about the circumstances for your family and for you in those early years of the war. Bill mentioned in the introduction that Hungary becomes an ally of Germany. This, is, this goes back and has tentacles back in the First World War. The details are not important. But what is important is because Hungary is an ally, it is not occupied by the Germans. <clears throat> the Germans do not come in, the Nazis do not come into Budapest until 44. Mm -hmm. So until that time, my recollection is much more of the war, not of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. The Holocaust doesn't come to Budapest until, certainly not into my life until a bit later. The war meant air raids once, twice a night. From the east came the Russians, from the west came the Western Allies. Budapest was not devastated as some German cities, some Hungarian cities were, but it had significant damage. And for kids six years old to have to go to the shelters once, sometimes twice, and occasionally three times a night was kind of an unnerving experience, particularly when you hear the bombs. And what you don't know is whether the bomb that fell nearby might have hit the building right next door to your apartment building. And that's where like, two or three kids that you went to school with lived. So the concept of this kind of devastation was very unnerving. Mm -hmm. Other things began to happen, as you mentioned, Bill. The Hungarian anti-Jewish laws called the numerous clauses were promulgated in the 20s. They were not put, in, put into effect, but they were on the books. As the 30s became, began to come towards the end, they were enforced. And all kinds of kind of uncomfortableness was created by this. Example, one day a guy comes to the door and he says, I have to take your phone. My father says to him, why? I use the phone for work. He says, very less, too, too bad. There's a law that says Jews may not have telephones. Now you don't have to understand that there's no logic or reason for this. It's just the law. If somebody once said in this city or this country, uh, it doesn't have to be, to, it doesn't have to make sense. It's just a policy. So that, uh, that's what happened. Other things happened of that same nature. First grade that you see the picture over there was just before I had to go to first grade with a star, mm -hmm. right? Now I thought that was a major mark of distinction. I was just like all the adults. I was a little guy, six years old, going to school with a star. I later discovered uh, it's not quite as much of a star, but I went to school and I heard that most every day, if not every day, somebody would follow me to school. Now, please understand, we lived at number, thir number 13 of the street where we lived. The school was at number 44, two blocks away. My parents' bedroom in the apartment building on the fifth floor was in the corner of the building. From their bedroom, you could see the school out the window. Yet somebody would follow me, and the question is why? Because this thing called the mark of distinction thought the little boy was really a target. It was perfectly okay to somebody to come by and whack you on the head. They don't want your shoes, your coat, your backpack, or anything else. But they want to whack you on the head because you're a kid with a star which says it's okay. Those are the kinds of things that were happening. You, um, you shared with me that you had really wanted a bicycle and your father wouldn't get it for you. And, and tell us why he wouldn't. Well, this has to do with the yellow star again now. In nine, from 1943 on, really 42, my father was conscripted into what they called the labor battalions. Bill mentioned that the Hungarian army, the men, were in the Eastern Front fighting against Russia. Well, to backfill the work that these people couldn't do, they conscripted the Jewish community who could not serve in the army. My father would get a telephone call or a letter or somebody would come to the door and say, knock, knock, please, uh, show up at this train station at three o'clock on Tuesday, you'll be gone for a day, a week, a month, or an undetermined period of time. And from 42, late 42 on, I didn't see him regularly. He'd come and go based on these orders. One of the times he's home, I said to him, Pop, uh, I have this kind of overgrown tricycle. I'm now almost seven years old. Would you consider a bike? He says, sure. I couldn't quite handle a full-size bike, but I could an 18, like an 18 incher. But he said, there are two reasons why he's not going to get a bike. I said, why? One is a minor reason, just an inconvenience. We lived on the top floor, the fifth floor of the apartment building, which was 50 years old. 
So was the elevator in the apartment building. And on many occasions, that elevator did not work. It was a mechanically run elevator, and parts broke. And the forge places that used to do the repair for this were now involved in military hardware. So the elevator material was very low on the priority list. So my father says, look, I have to take the bicycle, truck it down five flights, go out to the park, ride the bike, come back and truck it upstairs. He said, and I couldn't do that because at that age I couldn't take an 18-inch bike up and down five flights of stairs. My father said, look, I mean, it's not a pleasant idea, but I'm willing to do that. However, you go into the park and you ride the bike and you're out of my sight for 10 seconds with your yellow star. It is quite likely somebody might have whack you on the head. They don't want the bike. They don't want your shoes. They don't want anything. They just want to whack you on the head. And for that reason, there'll be no bike for you now. Later, we'll think about it. And I can add to it that when we came to this country in 1949, I was in seventh grade. We lived in New York. Come back from school one afternoon. He says, we're going shopping. Guess what we're going shopping for? A bicycle. That, that's wonderful. Before you, I think, before you started having to wear the yellow star, um, I believe in December 1941, your family had a really horrifying experience while visiting your aunt in another city. Tell us about that. As I said, the Holocaust didn't touch us until later. However, there's a particular experience that's clearly Holocaust related, which I can tell you about. I had no understanding of what it meant. Not at the age of five and a half. Now, as I said, my mother comes from southern Hungary, northern Yugoslavia. My grandparents, her parents, lived there as the two aunts and a cousin. In December of 41, winter time, Christmas time, I was not yet in school. My parents decided to take a trip by train to visit the family. Travel was still quite easy in those days. So we go down to uh, the city called Novi Sad. Uh, just to give you confusion, Novi Sad had three names because it was Hungary, Austro-Hungary, and Yugoslavia. Novi Sad, Uyvidek, and Neuzatz, depending on which week you were talking about. Well, we go to Novi Sad, and I stayed at my, my mother had two sisters. We stayed in the younger sister's house, and uh, I don't recall exactly what happened. Uh, it was a bit of an adventure. I know that her husband owned a cork factory, and he took me to the factory. I don't know what the heck they were doing. Cork for bottles, and I guess other cork products. It was interesting. He took me there. He had a seat installed on the front of his bicycle, and we drove to the, to the uh, factory, not very far. And nothing much happened the first day or two, maybe even three, I don't recall exactly. On the third day, early in the morning, somebody comes up the stairs or the elevator and says, there's something funky going on on the street. Five minutes later, knock, knock on the door. Two well-dressed police officers are standing there and says, ladies and gentlemen, and I thought it would be very pleasant about it. You need to come outside. Why? We must, must run a census. Well, now, we run a census in this country every 10 years. The Nazis believe that if they run a census every 25 minutes, they could keep track of people. Mm -hmm. And they were right. But it was still unusual on Friday morning, 7.30 in the morning on the street, very unusual. But it didn't seem dangerous. So we did what we were told. They said, dress warmly. It's not a blizzard outside. It was winter time. It was very pleasant, cold weather. We put on, you know, gloves and muffs and whatever else we did. Out to the street, lined up on the street, sidewalk. We're told to turn left and to start marching in this direction. Now, I remember clearly that we marched. That, I shouldn't say march, just walked. Nobody hassled us. On the guard and stuff, but we were walking in that direction for a good two to three hours. I walked. My mother carried me, my father carried me, I'm five and a half years old, I'm a little guy. Until we arrived at a place which I recognized. On my left was an eight foot stockade fence. Then the sidewalk with us on it, and then to the right was a major street, like maybe 14th Street outside. Now those of you who have been to Europe might know this, but those who have not, might not. Cities which are not on the ocean or on a big lake but on a river, would in fact create beaches in the summertime on the river. This city is on the Danube River, major river in Europe. In the summertime, on the other side of the stockade fence, were hot pools and cold pools and wave pools and thermal pools and recreation places and amusement parks and restaurants. I remember having been there, this is December, in August, 
four months before I was there, and I remembered what it is. I recognized the stockade fence. Why we were here, of course, nobody, not only I, nobody knew. As we were kind of walking along the fence, we see that the big gates to the fence, to the lot of fence, are open, and people are going to the gates and making a left turn. The river was about three to 400 yards away from here in that direction. And we were ambling in that direction, again, having no idea why, what, or who. As we we're doing this, there's a policeman standing on our right side, kind of on the street, who says to my father, Mister, what are you doing here? My father, kind of bewildered, says to him, well, I'm here visiting my family. To which he says, well, that's your business, that's not mine. But for the purpose of the census, you can be part of this crowd. You mess up the numbers. You're not from here. And I know that. My father says, how do you know that? He says, because I'm a foot patrolman in your neighborhood in Budapest. I've seen you on the street dozens and dozens of times. I recognized you. Stand aside. So my mother and I and he and some of the other members of this little clan of ours, although they're local, stand aside. Probably minutes, if not seconds, after this takes place, a staff car comes flying down the road, an officer gets out, talks to his uh, comrades, gets to the bullhorn and says, ladies and gentlemen, the requirements of the census have been met. Go home. A five and a half year old doesn't understand what's going on, of course, but neither does anybody else. We go back to my aunt's apartment and the phone begins to ring. The first call comes from my other aunt, my mother had two sisters, who says, where were you all day? We had some plans. To which we say, we tell her what's going on. She says, that's interesting. Two police officers came to my door at 7.30 in the morning, said they have to do a census, asked me four questions. They said, thank you. I said, thank you. They left. I've been calling you all day long. As the phone calls began to come in, slowly, we began to understand what took place. Those people who went to the gate turned left and marched to the river which was, to our knowledge, iced up to about three feet of depth, which had been, in fact, cannonballed, cracked that morning. They were lined up by the river, shot in the back into the water. To be found when the river thawed in March, if they were found, or if they floated down underneath the ice, maybe they came up someplace where the ice was thinner. Because remember, the Danube goes all the way to the Black Sea. This was a pogrom, P-O-G-R-O-M, a pogrom which is a senseless, purposeless, useless, and valueless exercise in my saying, I can do this to you, and there's not a blessed thing you can do about it. And a great number were killed that day, weren't they? Thousands. Thousands. Several thousands, not just Jews, but among them many Jews and others. And the whole purpose, the whole point here was that there had been some kind of if you're familiar with the partisans that did begin to exist, there was some partisan activity. They exploded the truck, messed up a railroad car or something, and as retribution for this, they put on this mass pogrom, the pogrom of Novi Sad, 1941. I can tell you what happened in detail. Of course, I had no idea what that meant right. until many years later. Next morning, back to Budapest. And that, that particular pogrom, um, a lot has been written about it in the years since, in part because it was so unbelievably brutal, but also because it just seemed to have come out of nowhere, just out of nowhere. You continue to live in Budapest under these, these awful circumstances, but things changed dramatically in March 1944 when the Germans occupied Budapest. What led to the Germans coming in and occupying it because they were allies of the Hungarians? And what changed so quickly for you and your family? First of all, the allied ship, if there's such a word, ceases to take place in 1943. Uh, Hitler and Horthy, who was the leader of the Hungarians, have a disagreement. Horthy disagrees with the kind of transportation through Hungary of Jews to camps. Anyhow, the allied ship breaks down. In 1941, piece of history for you, the second man in the German government, Hermann Goering, writes a letter on behalf of Hitler to talk about the final solution 
to the Jewish problem. It is written, it is not acted upon until 42 when there's a conference in Berlin called the Wannsee Conference. For those of you who are going through the museum, you'll see a display of this upstairs on the third floor. The Wannsee Conference is called by the leader of the SS in Prague, a general who was later assassinated by the underground. It is called for the purpose of, in fact, putting into action and activating the mechanics of the final solution. They appoint a man to be the leader of, this, these, this, of these activities. Anybody recall his name? Eichmann. Correct. Whoever said that? Adolf Eichmann, a lieutenant colonel in the German army who is the chief of the mechanical, of the logistics. He clears Europe from 1943, or early 42. He begins to clear all of Jews into concentration camps, killing camps, labor camps, and so forth. Because Hungary had been an ally, it's the last one to be approached. He does not get into Hungary until the 19th of March, 1944. 1944. So as I said to you earlier, the war comes late, the Holocaust comes late, it does. Now there were some elements of the Holocaust, for example, my grandmother, my father's mother, my father and his brothers decided that she should move back into her little village where my father was raised because it would be easier for her no air raids. She had some problem with her feet and to go up and down the stairs once, twice, three times a night into the shelters became very difficult. She was deported before they came to Budapest. They begin to clean Hungary and he arrives in Budapest itself and Germany occupies Hungary in March of 44. By this time my father's in a labor camp, home irregularly and infrequently. We have certain restrictions in the community, but basically my life as a seven and a half year old is perfectly okay. My parents saw to it that uh, I would live in a kind of a bubble. So I was not touched by this. Remember, I had no bike from which I could be whacked on the head. I was not whacked at going to school. I had some friends and life goes on. As soon as Eichmann arrives in Budapest, two men, from kind of a semi-self-appointed rescue community, <coughs> approach him with a deal. Now you need to understand, folks, that to approach Eichmann in Budapest in 1944 was about as easy as going to Rome and saying, I want to talk to the Pope one-on-one -on -one today. Mm -hmm. Not easy. But they talked their way in. One of the two is a lawyer from Romania, a Jewish lawyer from Romania, and his partner, who's an engineer trained in Germany, approach Eichmann, and they come up with a proposal. But before I tell you the proposal, I need to tell you that at this point, in March of 44, it seems that every leader of Germany, with one exception, knows that the war is going to be not in their favor. Now, this is before D-Day, but there were some elements of this. Hitler wouldn't believe it until the day he dies, but everybody else did. So they did what might seem logical, they decided to find ways, if they could, to make any kind of arrangements for their lives after the war, if they survive. I go back to whoever said, that it was Eichmann, whoever said that might know, that Eichmann after the war, which he survives, winds up where? Anybody know? Argentina. Now he didn't go to Argentina based on his army wages. He and others, not that many, but many had some deals made. Joseph Mengele, the famous doctor from Auschwitz, was another one. They all wind up in South America with a certain amount of loot with which they can live. Because I would imagine to have Eichmann in Argentina go to some employment agent and say, I'm Adolf Eichmann, I killed six million people, give me a job, would be difficult. So they made provisions. The provisions they were going to make were based on the following deal. If Eichmann releases one million Jews from the concentration camps, they would supply him with 10,000 trucks laden with material for the war. Now, there are two enormous problems with this proposal. If Eichmann wanted to, somebody's giggling, of course. If Eichmann wanted to release a million, which he didn't, he didn't have a million to release anymore. Most had been killed by 44. As far as the trucks are concerned, <coughs> I can assure you, these guys didn't have a hubcap let alone trucks. 
It was an, it was an incredibly audacious proposal. Yep. You begin this way, so you can wind up yeah. this way. One of the two men is sent to Egypt. The British were in Egypt, and they were in, apparently in charge of all logistics and, and, and movement and vehicular stuff for the whole war effort in Europe. So Joel Brown goes to Egypt, and he talks to the people who think he's a spy. They stick him in jail. He's in jail until the end of the war, which is a year later. And he comes out of jail, and he lives the rest of his life as happily as he could. But no trucks. I mean, there was never any thought of trucks. These negotiations go from 10,000 trucks and a million people to something short of 1,700 people for what is called valuables. Now, you need to know valuables need to be portable. Some of you may know, who have lived overseas particularly, that certain valuables are always tradable for a meal, a room, a ride, whatever. These valuables were collected from all over the world, including the Hungarian jewelry, in suitcases. Two or three of them, reputedly about $2 million worth. Now, $2 million in 1943 were a lot more than they are today. The money was not, the, the, the valuables, the, the value of the stuff was not turned over to Eichmann at that time. He told us that he would give us 35 freight cars, like the one you're going to see upstairs if you go into the museum, and we would be transported directly to some neutral port to be discharged from Europe. Hitler's position was, get the Jews out of Europe, uh, Germany, he did that. Get the Jews out of Europe, he didn't quite do that. The, the last one was to get Jews out of the world, that he did not achieve. We ride the train, we onboard the trains, 35 cars. I don't remember how many in each car, you'd have to divide 35 by, rather, 1,700 by 35. Each car has two buckets in it. One was for drinking water and the other was not. I don't recall anybody ever using them. But the weather was pretty good. It was nice in July. We, the train stopped every night, nine nights. We slept outside on the guard. We were told to pack some food. We were also supplied with some food from field kitchens at these various stops by the German or the Hungarian army. Now, you know that you can live without air for minutes water for hours and food for days. But we had food, that was not a problem. It was not a comfortable ride, obviously. We couldn't lie down in the cars, couldn't even sit down in the cars. We kind of stood all day long. Manny, I'm gonna interrupt you just for a second with a couple of questions. Your father was not with you, was Correct. he? Correct. So it was, it was you and your mother. Any other family members with you? My father's youngest brother, my, uh, my uncle, and a very distant cousin, which is a whole other story. And. Can you give any insight as to who those 1,700 were that got selected for that? Because while this is happening, of course, all the rest of the Jews are being rounded up and deported at an incredible rate. 14,000 a day. Yeah. 14,000 a day. Hundreds of railroad cars. To Auschwitz. Yep. Auschwitz, Birkenau, places. various places. A uh, few of them came back. Some did. Uh, my two aunts did, actually, but that's, uh, I'll get to that a little later. You're asking how the group was composed. I don't know. What I do know is that apparently this little group of the survivor group or this rescue group got together and they were able to kind of allocate a number of spaces in the group to various organizations, the religious, the non-religious, the Zionist, the non-Zionist, the Orthodox, the Neolog, you name it, every group had something. I don't know what group we fit, we, we fit into, but my uncle was particularly active both in the Zionist organizations and the underground, mm -hmm. was able to secure these spaces. My father was in a labor camp in continent, not continent, but in geographic Hungary. He was in a city about 40 miles from Budapest called Vats, V-A-C. He could not come with us. I mean, for whatever it's worth, this is not his nobility, but the point simply was the Germans had some rules. If anybody walked away from these camps or escaped, they would then do a decimation the next day. A decimation, line everybody up, every 10th person gets shot. Simple, right? It kind of prevented escapes because you never knew who the 10th person would be. But my father, and, and, and uh, the point is that you couldn't just walk out anyhow. But even if you could have, he just couldn't. He survived the war in that 
1944 late, he and about 20 of his colleagues in his brigade or group or company of labor battalion people just decided to walk away. Now this is when the Nazis are retreating, the Russians are coming, there was chaos, they were able to get away and they actually walked back now from the Ukraine back in Budapest. Long road, they rode trains as they could, they stole food. My father told them that they cooked potatoes in the exhaust of automobiles, of trucks. You do what you can, you survive. But uh, So you're in the train with 1,700 people for right, nine days. Various groups. Yep. And we arrived at a place, again, to my knowledge, and I didn't know any of the adults, but I, you know, they didn't talk to eight-year-olds. But the point remains, I don't believe anybody knew where we were going because when we arrived at a place called Bergen-Belsen, people said, what's this? We were told, you're going to spend three days here for R&R before you board ships. Sounds good to us. Now, Bergen-Belsen, Bill mentioned earlier, is a half an hour or so from the city of Hanover, <clears throat> which is a major railhead, and not that terribly far from Hamburg even, which is a major shipping point for Germany, northern Germany. We were put into barracks, and there we are. Apparently, negotiations continued, and sometimes after six weeks, 350 of our people, in fact, were taken out of there for a piece of the ransom. I wasn't one of them. Four or five months after that, in December, we were all released into Switzerland. And before you tell us about going to Switzerland, Bergen-Belsen, of course, many in our audience may, may know that as the place where Anne Frank died. A terrible camp, horrible. What, was your, what were your conditions like for you? What do you recall of that, knowing that you were still a young boy? Anne Frank comes to Bergen-Belsen in August of 1944. I come to Bergen-Belsen in July of 44. Now, I didn't know her. I mean, this is not play date and cell phone time. I mean, obviously, and besides, she was 16 and I was eight, she would have nothing to do with me. But she was, we were there at the same time, under the same conditions. The same miserable, rainy fall weather, the miserable mud that we had to stand outside in, sometimes from four in the morning till 11, for the census again, and all the other things. And of course, in many parts of the camp, the typhus, if any of our folks are here are physicians or in the medical field, you might know, that you saw a slide for typhus once in medical school in your third year on Tuesday. That's all you know about it. It was eradicated with antibiotics, but it was a major killer in the camps, major. Three things killed people in Bergen-Belsen. Starvation, malnutrition, and typhus. If you see documentaries of the camp's liberation, and you see bulldozers pushing bodies into mass graves, as horrible as it might sound, that was Bergen Belsen. It had to be done in order to bury these bodies so that the typhus bug doesn't go all over Europe and create the Black Plague of the 13th century. Life in Bergen Belsen was, for us, particularly acceptable, quote unquote, because we were not turned out to go to work. Mm -hmm. Why? because the Nazis realized that if they turn us out to work and people begin to die, that reduces the per capita ransom that they had. They kept us alive because you can't ransom a dead body. As a consequence, the one thing we didn't have was the going to work every day, and we saw people going to work. And I would imagine some went to work and never came back. Right. We were in the camp, conditions were, as I said, poor, but we were only there for five and a half months, all told. Mm -hmm. Five and a half months is not four years, as some people had. I was, I was struck, though, when you, you, you said there, even five months is a long time in, in bad conditions, obviously, and you said there was attempts by your group to try to create as much normalcy as you, as you could, <laughs> given the circumstances. Will you tell us a little bit of, about what that of course, meant? Of course. Normalcy means that you do that which you did before you were incarcerated. Now, there were 35 physicians in camp and they couldn't do anything because they had nothing to do it with. There was no medication available to them. <coughs> but they could examine and they could do this and that and the other thing. We had others. 
the first group that began to become active were folks who were in business back home. Ladies and gentlemen, businesses opened up within weeks. You might find it to be amusing, but that's what they did. Because after all, they went to work every day back home, and they did this, this, and this. They sold, they bought, they traded, they manufactured. It's exactly what they did in terms of Bergen-Belsen possibilities. When we were going to go to Bergen-Belsen, we were told to bring certain kinds of foods with us for the, for the ride to get to the boats. Somebody in the community, I don't remember his name, but my parents knew him, was a gentleman who had some kind of a factory that had to do with tin cans, like food, you know, aluminum cans. And we could have aluminum cans resealed. So what you did is you'd cook food, you put it into these cans, still warm, and then you sealed it on the top to make it hermetically sealed and to prevent botches from happening until a certain amount of time. As we got to the camp, people ate the food to supplement the little that we received. And after that, they washed the cans, and guess what? Jewelry stores opened up. From the tin cans. From the tin cans. From the tin cans. Somebody knew how to make bracelets, necklaces, earrings, rings from this metal. Mm -hmm. My mother packed some tin cans, I don't know how many and I don't know how long it lasted, and three other items that, I'm sorry, yeah, three other items that I remember she packed. <coughs> Based on either her th thinking or somebody recommended, that you take a liter of honey, nutritious, a liter of chicken fat in, in, a, in a bottle, and a big several kilo of bacon. Now you might say, well, that sounds to make sense. But ladies and gentlemen, in a kosher home of a canter, bacon did not exist. On the conditions of this, there were certain dispensations given, because if it keeps you alive, it's a good thing. The litter of honey, the litter of chicken fat, and the bacon lasted the whole time that we were in camp. How? I don't know. Your mother made it last, it sounds like. During that time, you got very ill, though. Um, tell us about that. I did two things in camp in the five or six months we were there. I learned how to be bored. I was very good at it. There's nothing to do. Yes, there was a school that was started. There was a synagogue that was started. There was this and that and the other thing. But there were no playgrounds. There was no equipment. There's no soccer balls. So I got to, got to, and I don't remember what I did. I can't remember. I can't even remember kids I played with. And there were kids I played with. The picture you saw at the beginning, several of the kids, well, all of the kids in that picture were with me in camp. I don't remember any of them. Met some of them since camp. A couple of them have died since. I mean, we're old people. But I remember some after. I mean, I've met the last 30 or 40 years, but not 75 years ago. Mm -hmm. The other thing I did very well, I was sick. I got some kind of a multiple pneumonia disease of some sort. Now, as I said, there were 35 doctors in camp, but what could they do? Pneumonia you cure with antibiotics, which we didn't have, or the body cures itself with its own strength, which we did have in a sense, because obviously I'm here. What they did do is they decided to make me more comfortable. You might know, particularly those of you who may have some history or background in farming communities and smaller towns. Anybody of you have mustard plasters? Somehow they found mustard seed. You soak it in water, you crush it, it makes kind of a mustardy kind of a thing. You put a rag or burlap into it, which soaks it up. And you take this burlap and you stick it on my chest. Now, it has nothing to do with curing pneumonia, but it gives you the same reaction as any kind of Vicks or mentholate and vapor rub or anything like that. It's menthol, it's warm, it makes you feel better. So when you're breathing and it hurts because of your lungs, this gives you some warmth and some comfort. And that's what they that's did the as a palliative medical approach. And you, you managed to survive that, and in fact, you finally were released with your mother and others. The whole, whatever, 1,300 were left after the first 350 left, approximate numbers. Uh, we were taken into Switzerland, at which point my war ends. Mm -hmm. And uh, the war ends, and we'll talk about that now, right? Yeah, uh, tell us, just no. tell us very quickly 
what it was like when you went into Switzerland. We came to the camp in the freight cars that you'll see upstairs. We left the camp actually in passenger cars. There were true passenger cars. They were not first class by a long, long shot, but at least they had seats. We're taken from Germany to Switzerland and across the border. Now, for those of you who may know, this may not be news, but for those you don't know, the railroad cars from Germany cannot go into Switzerland because the gauge of the, of the, of the width of the tracks are different. That's done deliberately to make sure that nobody can invade Switzerland by train because the train won't go. So we arrive on one side of the platform from, the Germany, from Germany on the German trains. On the other side of the platform are these Swiss, big, beautiful, lit, warm, hot chocolate laden trains into which were transferred and taken to a community with a large gymnasium. Well, what is the first thing that the Swiss did to us was they fumigated all of us. To get rid of the lice and whatever else we had, I'm sure we did, because the Swiss didn't want to be bothered with this kind of vermin. Do you, do you remember the reaction of the adults? Um, were they, do they feel now they were truly safe once they got across the border? Well, Switzerland? we didn't know. You didn't know, yeah. But the anticipation was, because by this time there was some involvement with the Red Cross, mm -hmm and some others, and we were taken to, if anybody knows Switzerland, this is in St. Gallen, which is in the German part. We were trained to the French part, to the area of Bontreux, above which there is a community called Co, C-A-U-X. Co had a beautiful residential, uh, not residential, tourist hotel, which the Red Cross had taken over for people like us and others. Mm -hmm. There for several weeks, they fed us lots of potatoes to fatten us up a little bit. Now, please understand, we were not the skeletons that you see walking around in Bergen Belsen, but all of our ribs could be counted. And we got fattened up, and of course, then they had to discharge people to various places because others were coming in, and there was an arrangement made by an organization in Zurich to send 20 kids, Jewish, Hungarian kids, ages six to 14, en masse to a place in the German part of Switzerland again, in Haydn, to this children's home of which you saw the picture. That's the group. And then they had to come up with somebody who would go along with them to be both a teacher and a caretaker and an interlocutor and a translator. We spoke fluent Hungarian. Nobody in Haydn spoke one word of Hungarian. Now, they found a person who had been a teacher when she was a younger woman, and believe it or not, it was my mother. Well, sometimes having your mother with you is the best thing, and sometimes it's the worst thing, because you're the teacher's kid. But my mother had very good German, of course she had Hungarian, and she had a, a, a good amount of French from school. So they, when we went, that's where we were, and that's where, we were, where the war comes to an end. Tell, and that, and the war comes to an end on the 8th of May, 1945, a very important date in history. The war comes to an end on May the 8th, it is the birthday of the President of the United States at the time. Who's that? Truman. Truman. Often we hear the word Roosevelt, which is not too far off. I think Roosevelt dies the 12th or so, or 14th of April, weeks before. So in our situation, as we all know, in 20 minutes the Vice President becomes President, and Harry Truman has a birthday on May the 8th. So we have the war, Harry Truman, and as Bill said earlier, on May the 8th of this year, I too will have another birthday. I have one every year. So the three of us, Harry, the war, and I share a birthday. Before we, uh, I want to leave just a few minutes to, for our audience to ask you a couple of questions, Manny, but tell us about reuniting with your father. And, and before you do, during that whole ordeal, leaving Budapest by train, going to Bergen-Belsen, and then on to Switzerland, did your mother and father have any contact with each other during that time, and then how they reunited? They had no contact because obviously, it, as I said, the cell phones didn't work so well in Bergen-Belsen. But the point that's important here is that my father could actually trace our group because of this special group. It was known as the Kastner group or the Kastner train, and there were others, but he could trade them. Kastner himself, the man who negotiated this, stayed in Budapest. His family was with us in camp. But his, he stayed, my father was able to go see him and demand the information of where we were. We were still in Bergen-Belsen. He had some way of tracing us. 
communication with my mother at the time was impossible. It didn't take place. In Switzerland, we were able to do something a little better. <laughs> now, this is December of 44 and January of 45. My father had a colleague with whom we went to school in Vienna who was a cantor in Zurich. My mother knew him. She made contact with him in Switzerland, easy. She went to see him, I think, a couple times, and they talked by phone, whatever. He could have contact with Hungary, because from a Swiss neutral country, there are telephone arrangements they could have. So my mother talks to him, he talks to my father, I don't mean talk. My father responds maybe by telegram, and the man then talks to my mother. My father said, look, I'm back in Budapest, we have the apartment, I have a job, come on back. My mother said, I will never set foot in Hungary again, as long as I live, and she did. My father did, I did, Adrian and I went back to Budapest several times since that time. My mother would never do it. Went back to Yugoslavia. She was not angry with the Serbs. She was angry with the Hungarians. In any case, my father had come back. My mother said no. We went south through Italy and eventually wound up in what was then Palestine. We were there in 1945 in September, in August of 46. My father is able to arrive through a story which is another whole other story. And quite a story. About illegal immigration and all that. But that's when the family is reunited. One of the consequences of the war, I am sure, one of the negative consequences, I think, although I don't know how I would have been, had it been different, is that I'm an only child. I was born in 36, Bill told you. My cousins were born in 35, 36, 37, and 38. My mother had three sister, um, two sisters and three brothers. Six families, right? These six families produced five children. I think they all decided in the later 30s, which is when siblings would have been coming, that this is not a place and a time in which to bring children. So except for my uncle, my mother's brother, who had two children, one had one, one had one, one had none, the girls had one, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that being an only child, and I don't know how it would have been if I hadn't been one, I have no such right. thing to compare to is one of the consequences of war. I, there's so many more things that I'd like to ask you about and I know you would like to talk about, but let's take just a couple of minutes with our audience and see if you folks Thanks. have any questions. If you have a question, we ask that you go to the microphone. There's one in each aisle. Um, please make your question as brief as you can. I'll repeat it just to be sure that we hear it right and, um, and then Manny will respond to it. And Emily, you have one for us. We have, we have a question from um, a group watching online this morning's class in Iowa. They would like to know if you were ever treated differently um, by your classmates or by uh, your friends that were non-Jewish. The question was, were you ever treated differently by classmates or friends that were not Jewish? I didn't have any friends in school who were not Jewish because I went to a parochial school. It was a Jewish school down the street. As it happens, the only kids I can remember who were not Jewish that I had anything to do with were two girls who lived next door to me in the apartment right next door to us, whom I saw with great frequency. One was younger than I, one was older than I. Mm -hmm. When we were talking about ages five to eight or something like that, with whom I had as good a relationship as you can have with a girl. Okay, <laughs> all right, uh, do we have another question? <laughs> Got a brave soul. I'm also gonna ask uh, if you can stay with us because before we close, Manny's gonna say a few more words to us before we end our program. Yes, sir. Were any of the other, were any of the other Jewish families at Bergen-Belsen, were they resentful that you guys were kind of given a, I don't know, maybe like a pass almost out of like work and you know, struggle and all that stuff? Were, were other, other uh, inmates at Bergen-Belsen, were they resentful? Would, would you have known that and was it possible? Well, I would not have known. We had no contact with them. There may have been, as it happens, where we were in our set of barracks, one side was a field, one side was a forest, one side was the main road to the camp. So any contact with was on one side, which was several hundred yards away with barbed wire. Now, historically, <laughs> there were all kinds of resentments I'll tell you a tiny, tiny story. There's a gentleman here in town, a very well-known physician, became quite wealthy, and by some coincidence, he and many others and I were 
at the old American Film Institute, which was still the Kennedy Center, to see a certain Israeli television program, not important. At the end of which, the producer talked, an author talked, and all of a sudden, this little gentleman down in front of us gets up and starts hollering at me. He says, I was a 27-year-old senior surgeon at the Jewish hospital in Budapest, and I was not in the group, and you were. Okay? We got to be friends later on, and he didn't holler at me anymore. But I'm saying there was tremendous resentment by the non-selected community. But you know, how do you put four elephants into a Volkswagen? Two in the front and two in the back, right? It's the same thing here. How much do you put 10,000 people into 35 cars? You can't. Uh, I was fortunate, lucky, of course, period. Thank, Thank you. you. We have one more question here before we turn back to Manny to close our program. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Emily, and my question is, um, how did you feel when the war ended? Okay. Question is, how did you feel when the war ended? When you knew that it was over for you and your family and your community? I'm not sure it had the kind of impact that you might think, because it wasn't something like, like stopped. When the war ended, I'm in Switzerland in a very safe place, and the day before and the day after were exactly alike. And I had classes, whatever. The end of the war becomes much more prominent to me when I have to learn a new language, a new country, new people. Understand that the war in Switzerland was not taking place. It's a neutral country. So life, as I said, on Friday, on Tuesday was the same as on Wednesday when the war ended and on Thursday, which followed it. For, for me as a kid, as I remember it. I, I, didn't, I didn't reunite with my family or my spouse or my children. I didn't go back to my home and find my stuff either wrecked or now missing or whatever. So many of those things that adult experienced, I did not. Yeah. I think I'm going to have to It's good to be a kid. I think because of time, I'm going to have to I'm not be able to have you ask the question. But I'm going to ask you and anybody else, when Manny is finished, please feel free to come up on the stage and ask Manny the question or... Uh, say hi to him, shake his hand, uh, give him a hug, he'll take that. Uh, whatever you want to do, we're, we're good with that. So um, I want to thank you first for all being here. Remind you we'll have first-person programs each Wednesday and Thursday through August 8th. Our programs will be live cast, live streamed through May, uh, June 6th, but all programs will be shown on the museum's YouTube channel. So if you can't make it back in person, there are other ways to see our programs, and we hope that you do that. It's our tradition at first person, our first person gets the last word. And so with that, I'm going to turn back to Manny to close our program today. In the very introduction, Bill talked about the fact that I am a volunteer at the museum and do many things. One of the things that I sometimes do and I used to do more is sit at the so-called information desk upstairs where the most frequently asked question is, where is the restroom? But when people ask, where do you begin, where do you end, what do you do here, you begin to discover that the level of knowledge that exists in a community is abominable. Okay? Now, you folks did one of many steps, and I don't know who you are, of course, to come to this museum, perhaps to come to this program, but more so to come to this museum to see it, to learn. However, there's much more to be learned, and I would like to challenge you. I've not done this in a number of places at the end of my talks. And I said, folks, we live in a world where machinery exists like this or anything like this where you can record stuff. And I'm going to ask you to go home and get a hold of your parents, grandparents, and children and record their story, which probably is not recorded and will probably be lost to posterity. I mean, I find it very, very difficult to, to accept when I ask somebody a question of where were your grandparents born or went to school or what work did they do, and they can't answer. Or I ask a young man or a young kid, where do your parents work? Here in Washington. And of course, the response is, for the government. OK, OK. Could you give me a little bit more like what department maybe, or what do you do in the government? You know, are you a spy or not? Something. <laughs> And I challenge all of you to see to it that your family histories are either recorded, updated, or somehow put down in posterity 
so that your grandchildren can know what the heck what took place. Thank you. Thank you. Very much.